The Secrets of the Federal Reserve by Eustace Mullins. Chapter 5. The House of Rothschild. The success of the Federal Reserve conspiracy will raise many questions in the minds of readers who are unfamiliar with the history of the United States and finance capital. How could the kuhn loeb morgan alliance, powerful though it might be, believe that it would be capable, first, of devising a plan which would bring the entire money and credit of the people of the United States into their hands, and second, of getting such a plan enacted into law? The capability of devising and enacting the National Reserve Plan, as the immediate result of the Jekyll Island expedition was called, was easily within the powers of the kuhn loeb morgan alliance, according to the following from McClure's magazine, August 11th, The Seven Men, by John Moody. Quote, Seven men in Wall Street now control a great share of the fundamental industry and resources of the United States. Three of the seven men, J.P. Morgan, James J. Hill, and George F. Baker, head the First National Bank of New York, belonging to the so-called Morgan Group. Four of them, John D. and William Rockefeller, James Stillman, head of the National City Bank, and Jacob H. Schiff, of the private banking firm of Kuhn, Loeb Company, to the so-called Standard Oil City Bank Group. The central machine of capital extends its control over the United States. The process is not only economically logical, it is now practically automatic. Close quote. Thus we see that in the 1910 plot to seize control of the money and credit of the people of the United States was planned by men who already controlled most of the country's resources. It seemed to John Moody, quote-unquote, practically automatic, that they should continue with their operations. What John Moody did not know, or did not tell his readers, was that the most powerful men in the United States were themselves answerable to another power, a foreign power, and a power which had been steadfastly seeking to extend its control over the young republic of the United States since its very inception. The power was the financial power of England, centred in the London branch of the House of Rothschild. The fact was that in 1910, the United States was for all practical purposes being ruled from England. And so it is today. The ten largest bank holding companies in the United States are firmly in the hands of certain banking houses, all of which have branches in London. They are J.P. Morgan Company, Brown Brothers Harriman, Warburg, Kuhn, Loeb, and J. Henry Schroeder, all of them maintain close relationships with the House of Rothschild, principally through the Rothschild control of international money markets through its manipulation of the price of gold. Each day, the world price of gold is set in the London office of N. M. Rothschild & Company. Although these firms are ostensibly American firms, which merely maintain branches in London, the fact is that these banking houses actually take their direction from London. Their history is a fascinating one, and unknown to the American public, originating as it did in the international traffic in gold, slaves, diamonds, and other contraband. There are no moral considerations in any business decision made by these firms. They are interested solely in money and power. Tourists today gape at the magnificent mansions of the very rich in Newport, Rhode Island, without realising that not only do these cottages stand as a memorial to the baronial desires of our Victorian millionaires, but that, the, but that their erection in Newport represented a nostalgic memorialization of the great American fortunes, which had their beginning in Newport when it was the capital of the world's slave trade. The slave trade, for centuries, 
had its headquarters in Venice. Until 17th century Britain, the new master of the seas, used its control of the oceans to gain a monopoly. As the American colonies were settled, its fiercely independent people, most of whom did not want slaves, found to their surprise that slaves were being sent to our ports in great numbers. For many years, Newport was the capital of this unsavoury trade. William Ellery, the collector of the port of Newport, said in 1791, quote, An Ethiopian could as soon change his skin as a Newport merchant could be induced to change so lucrative a trade for the slow profits of any manufactory. Close quote. John Quincy Adams remarked in his diary, page 459, quote, Newport's former prosperity was chiefly owing to its extensive employment in the African slave trade. Close quote. The preeminence of J.P. Morgan and the Brown firm in American finance can be dated to the development of Baltimore as the 19th century capital of the slave trade. Both of these firms originated in Baltimore, open branches in London, came under the aegis of the House of Rothschild, and returned to the United States to open branches in New York and to become the dominant power, not only in finance, but also in government. In recent years, key posts such as Secretary of Defence have been held by Robert Lovett partner of Brown Brothers Harriman, and Thomas S. Gates, partner of Drexel & Company, a J.P. Morgan subsidiary firm. I believe that this very same Thomas S. Gates is a relative of uh, our friend Bill Gates. Anyway, continuing. The, pres the, vi the present vice president, George Bush, is the son of Prescott Bush, a partner of Brown Brothers Harriman, for many years the senator from Connecticut and the, finance, the financial organiser of Columbia Broadcasting System, of which he also was a director for many years. To understand why these firms operate as they do, it is necessary to give a brief history of their origins. Few Americans know that J.P. Morgan Company began as George Peabody and Company. George Peabody, 1795 to 1869, born at South Danvers, Massachusetts, began business in Georgetown, D.C. in 1814 as Peabody, Riggs and Company, dealing in wholesale dry goods and in operating the Georgetown slave market. In 1815, to be closer to their source of supply, they moved to Baltimore, where they operated as Peabody and Riggs from 1815 to 1835. Peabody found himself increasingly involved with business originating from London, and in 1835, he established the firm of George Peabody and Company in London. He had excellent entry in London business, through another Baltimore firm established in Liverpool, the Brown Brothers. Alexander Brown came to Baltimore in 1801 and established what is now known as the oldest banking house in the United States, still operating as Brown Brothers Harriman of New York, Brown, Shipley and Company of England, and Alex Brown and Son of Baltimore. The behind-the-scenes power wielded by this firm is indicated by the fact that Sir Montague Norman, governor of the Bank of England for many years, was a partner of Brown, Shipley and Company. Footnote. There is an informal understanding that the director of Brown, Shipley, should be on the board of the Bank of England, and Norman was elected to it in 1907. Montague Norman, current biography, 1940. Back to the text. Considered the single most influential banker in the world, Sir Montague Norman was organiser of quote-unquote informal talks between heads of the central banks in 
1927, which led directly to the great stock market crash of 1929. Soon after he arrived in London, George Peabody was surprised to be summoned to an audience with the gruff Baron Nathan Mayer Rothschild. Without mincing words, Rothschild revealed to Peabody that much of the London aristocracy openly disliked Rothschild and refused his invitations. He proposed that Peabody, a man of modest means, be established as a lavish host whose entertainments would soon be the talk of London. Rothschild would, of course, pay all the bills. Peabody accepted the offer, and soon became known as the most popular host in London. His annual Fourth of July dinner, celebrating American independence, became extremely popular with the English aristocracy, many of whom, while drinking Peabody's wine, regaled each other with jokes about Rothschild's crudities and bad manners without realising that every drop they drank was being paid for by Rothschild. It is hardly surprising that the most popular host in London would also become a very successful businessman, particularly with the House of Rothschild supporting him behind the scenes. Peabody often operated with a capital of £500,000 on hand, and became very astute in his buying and selling on both sides of the Atlantic. His American agent was the Boston for firm of Beebe, Morgan & Company, headed by Junius S. Morgan, father of John Pierpoint Morgan. Peabody, who never married, had no one to succeed him, and he was very favourably impressed by the tall, handsome Junius Morgan. He persuaded Morgan to join him in London as a partner in George Peabody & Company in 1854. In 1860, John Pierpoint Morgan had been taken on as an apprentice by the firm of Duncan Sherman in New York. Sorry, of Duncan Sherman of, in New York. He was not very attentive to business, and in 1864, Morgan's father was outraged when Duncan Sherman refused to make his son a partner. He promptly extended an arrangement whereby one of the chief employees of Duncan Sherman, Charles H. Dabney, was persuaded to join John Pierpoint Morgan in a new firm, Dabney, Morgan and Company. Bankers Magazine, December 1864, noted that Peabody had withdrawn his account from Duncan Sherman and that other firms were expected to do so. The Peabody account, of course, went to Damney Morgan Company. John Pierpoint Morgan was born in 1837, during the first money panic in the United States. Significantly, it had been caused by the House of Rothschild, with whom Morgan was later to become associated. In 1836, President Andrew Jackson infuriated by the tactics of the bankers who were attempting to persuade him to renew the charter of the Second Bank of the United States, said, quote, You are a den of vipers. I intend to rout you out, and by the eternal God I will rout you out. If the people only understood the rank injustice of our money and banking system, there would be a revolution before morning. Close quote. Although Nicholas Biddle was president of the Bank of the United States, it was well known that Baron James de Rothschild of Paris was the principal investor in this central bank. Although Jackson had vetoed the renewal of the charter of the Bank of the United States, he probably was unaware that a few months earlier, in 1835, the House of Rothschild had cemented a relationship with the United States government by superseding the firm of Bering, as financial agent of the Department of State on January 1st, 1835. Henry Clues, the famous banker in his book, 28 Years in Wall Street, states that the Panic of 1837 was engineered because the charter of the Second Bank of the United States had run out in 1836, not only did President Jackson promptly withdraw government funds from the Second Bank of the United States, 
but he deposited these funds, 10 million, in state banks. The immediate result, Clues tells us, is that the country began to enjoy great prosperity. This sudden flow of cash caused an immediate expansion of the national economy, and the government paid off the entire national debt, leaving a surplus of 50 million in the treasury. The European financiers had the answer to this situation. Clues further states, quote, The panic of 1837 was aggravated by the Bank of England, when it in one day threw out all the paper connected with the United States, close quote. The Bank of England, of course, was synonymous with the name of Baron Nathan Mayer Rothschild. Why did the Bank of England in one day throw out all paper connected with the United States, that is, refuse to accept or discount any securities, bonds or other financial paper based in the United States? The purpose of this action was to create an immediate financial panic in the United States, cause a complete contraction of credit, halt further issues of stocks and bonds, and ruin those seeking to turn United States securities into cash. In this atmosphere of financial panic, John Pierpoint Morgan came into the world. His grandfather, Joseph Morgan, was a well-to-do farmer who owned 106 acres in Hartford, Connecticut. He later opened the City Hotel and the Exchange Coffee Shop, and in 1819 was one of the founders of the Atna Insurance Company. George Peabody found that he had chosen well in selecting Junius S. Morgan as his successor. Morgan agreed to continue the Sub Rosa relationship with N.M. Rothschild Company and soon expanded the firm's activities by shipping large quantities of railroad iron to the United States. It was Peabody Iron which was the foundation of much of American railroad tracks from 1860 to 1890. In 1864, Content to retire and leave his firm in the hands of Morgan, Peabody allowed the name to be changed to Junius S. Morgan Company. The Morgan firm, then and since, has always been directed from London. John Pierpoint Morgan spent much of his time at his magnificent London mansion, Prince's Gate. One of the high watermarks of the successful Rothschild Peabody Morgan business venture was the Panic of 1857. It had been 20 years since the Panic of 1837. Its lessons had been forgotten by hordes of eager investors who were anxious to invest the profits of a developing America. It was time to fleece them again. The stock market operates like a wave washing up on the beach. It sweeps with it many minuscule creatures who derive all of their life support from the oxygen and water of the wave. They coast along at the crest of the tide of prosperity. Suddenly, the wave, having reached the high water mark on the beach, recedes, leaving all of the creatures gasping on the sand. Another wave may come in time to save them, but in all likelihood, it will not come as far and some of the sea creatures are doomed. In the same manner, waves of prosperity, fed by newly created money, through an artificial contraction of credit, recedes, leaving those it had borne high to grasp, to gasp and die without hope of salvation. Corsair, the life of J.P. Morgan, tells us that the Panic of 1857 was caused by the collapse of the grain market, and by the sudden collapse of the Ohio Life and Trust, for a loss of $5 million. With this collapse, 900 other American companies failed. Significantly, one not only survived, but prospered from the crash. In Corsair, we learn that the Bank of England lent George Peabody and Company £5 million during the Panic of 1857. Winkler, in Morgan the Magnificent, says that the Bank of England advanced Peabody £1 million, an enormous sum at the time, 
and the equivalent of $100 million today to save the firm. However, no other firm received such beneficence during the panic. The reason is revealed by Matthew Josephson in The Robber Barons. He says on page 60, quote, for, such quali- for such qualities of conservatism and purity, George Peabody and Company, the old tree out of which the House of Morgan grew, was famous. In the Panic of 1857, when depreciated securities had been thrown on the market by distressed investors in America, Peabody and the elder Morgan, being in possession of cash, had purchased such bonds as possessed real value freely, and then resold them at a large advance when sanity was restored. Thus, from a number of biographies of Morgan, the story can be pieced together. After the panic had been engineered, one firm came into the market with £1 million in cash, purchased securities from distressed investors at panic prices, and later resold them at an enormous profit. That firm was the Morgan firm, and behind it was the clever manoeuvring of Baron Nathan Mayer Rothschild. The association remained secret from the most knowledgeable financial minds in London and New York, although Morgan occasionally appeared as the financial agent in a Rothschild operation. As the Morgan firm grew rapidly during the 19th century, until it dominated the finances of the nation, many observers were puzzled that the Rothschilds seemed so little interested in profiting by investing in the rapidly advancing American economy. John Moody notes in The Masters of Capital, page 27, quote, the Rothschilds were content to remain a close ally of Morgan, as far as the American field was concerned, close quote. Secrecy was more profitable than valour. The reason that the European Rothschild preferred to operate anonymously in the United States behind the face of J.P. Morgan and company is explained by George Wheeler in Pierpoint Morgan and Friends, the Anatomy of a Myth, page 17. Quote, but there were steps being taken even now to bring him out of the financial backwaters, and they were not being taken by Pierpoint Morgan himself. The first suggestion of his name for a role in the recharging of the reserve originated with the London branch of the House of Rothschild, Belmont's employers. Close quote. Wheeler goes on to explain that a considerable anti-Rothschild movement had developed in Europe and the United States which focused on the banking activities of the Rothschild family. Even though they had a registered agent in the United States, August Schoenberg, who had changed his name to Belmont when he came to the United States as the representative of the Rothschilds in 1837, it was extremely advantageous to them to have an American representative who was not known as a Rothschild agent. Although the London house of Junius S. Morgan and Company continued to be the dominant branch of the Morgan Enterprises, with the death of the senior Morgan in 1890 in a carriage accident on the Riviera, John Pierpoint Morgan became the head of the firm. After operating as the American representative of the London firm from 1864 to 1871, as Dabney Morgan Company, Morgan took on a new partner in 1871, Anthony Drexel of Philadelphia, and operated as Drexel Morgan and Company until 1895. Drexel died in that year, and Morgan changed the name of the American branch to J.P. Morgan and Company. LaRouche tells us that on February 5th, 1891, a secret association known as the Round Table Group was formed in London by Cecil Rhodes, his banker, Lord Rothschild, the Rothschild in-law, Lord Rosebery, and Lord Curzon. He states that in the United States, the Round Table was represented by the Morgan Group. Dr. Carol Quigley refers to this group as, quote, the British American Secret Society, close quote, in Tragedy and Hope, 
stating that, quote, the chief backbone of this organization grew up along the already existing financial cooperation running from the Morgan Bank in New York to a group of international financiers in London led by Lazard Brothers in 1901, close quote. William Guy Carr in Pawns in the Game states that, quote, in 1899, J.P. Morgan and Drexel went to England to attend the International Bankers' Convention. When they returned, J.P. Morgan had been appointed head representative of the Rothschild interests in the United States. As a result of the London Conference, J.P. Morgan and Company of New York, Drexel and Company of Philadelphia, Grenfell and Company of London, and Morgan Har Harris C. of Paris, M.M. M. Warburg Company of Germany and America, and the House of Rothschild were all affiliated, close quote. Apparently unaware of the Peabody connection with the Rothschilds, and the fact that the Morgans had always been affiliated with the House of Rothschild, Carr supposed that he had uncovered this relationship as of 1899, when in fact it went back to 1835. Footnote. July 30, 1930. McFadden, Basis of Control of Economic Conditions This control of the world business structure and of human happiness and progress by a small group is a matter of the most intense public interest. In analysing it, we must begin with the internal group which centres itself around J.P. Morgan Company. Never before had there been such a powerful centralised control over finance industrial production, credit and wages, as is at this time vested in the Morgan Group. The Morgan control of the Federal Reserve System is exercised through government through control of the management of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. George F. Peabody, History of the Great American Fortunes, Gustavus Mayers, Mod, Lib., 537, notes that J.P. Morgan's father, Junius S. Morgan, had become a partner of George Peabody in the banking business. Quote, when the Civil War came on, George Peabody and company were appointed the financial representatives in England of the U.S. government. With this appointment, their wealth suddenly began to pile up, where hitherto they had amassed riches By stages not remarkably rapid, they now added many millions within a very few years. Close quote. According to writers of the day, the methods of George Peabody and Company were not only unreasonable, but double treason, in that, while in the act of giving inside aid to the enemy, George Peabody and Company were the potentiaries of the US government and were being well paid to advance its interests. Springfield Republic, in 1866, quote, For all who know anything on the subject know very well that Peabody and his partners gave us no faith and no help in our struggle for national existence. They participated to the fullest in the common English distrust of our cause and our success, and talked and acted for the South rather than for our nation. No individuals contributed so much to flooding our money markets and weakening financial confidence in our nationality than George Peabody and Company, and none made more money by the operation. All the money that Mr. Peabody is giving away so lavishly among our institutions of learning was gained by the speculations of his house in our misfortunes. Close quote. Also, New York Times, October 31st, 1866. Reconstruction, Reconstruction Carpetbaggers Money Fund. Lightning over the Treasury Building. John Elson. Meador Publishing Company, Boston, 41, page 53, quote. The Bank of England, with its subsidiary banks in America, brackets, under the domination of J.P. Morgan, close brackets, the Bank of France, and the Reichsbank of Germany, 
composed an interlocking and cooperative banking system, the main objective of which was the exploitation of the people. Close quote. Returning to the text. According to William Guy Carr in Pawns in the Game, the initial meeting of these ex officio planners took place in Meyer Amschel Bauer's goldsmith shop in Frankfurt in 1773. Bauer, who adopted the name of Rothschild or Red Shield, from the Red Shield which he hung over his door to advertise his business, brackets, the Red Shield today is the official coat of arms of the city of Frankfurt, close brackets, see the cover of this book, quote, was only 30 years of age when he invited 12 other wealthy and influential men to meet him in Frankfurt. His purpose was to convince them that if they agreed to pool their resources, they could then finance and control the world revolutionary movement and use it as their manual of action to win ultimate control of the wealth, natural resources and manpower of the entire world. This agreement reached. Mayer unfolded his revolutionary plan. The project would be backed by all the power that could be purchased with their pooled resources. By clever manipulation of their combined wealth, it would be possible to create such adverse economic conditions that the masses would be reduced to a state bordering on starvation by unemployment. Their paid propagandists would arouse feelings of hatred and revenge against the ruling classes by exposing all real and alleged cases of extravagance, licentious conduct, injustice, oppression and persecution. They would also invent infamies to bring into disrepute others who might, if left alone, interfere with their overall plans. Rothschild turned to a manuscript and proceeded to read a carefully prepared plan of action. 1. He argued that law was force, only in disguise. He reasoned it was logical to conclude, by the laws of nature, right lies in force. 2. Political freedom is an idea, not a fact. In order to usurp political power, all that was necessary was to preach liberalism so that the electorate, for the sake of an idea, would yield some of their power and prerogatives which the plotters could then gather in their own hands. 3. The speaker asserted that the power of gold had usurped the power of liberal rulers. He pointed out that it was immaterial to the success of his plan whether the established governments were destroyed by external or internal foes, because the victor had to of necessity ask the aid of capital, which is entirely in our hands. For he argued that the use of any and all means to reach their final goal was justified on the grounds that the ruler who governed by the moral code was not a skilled politician because he left himself vulnerable and in an unstable position. 5. He asserted that our right lies in force. The word right is an abstract thought and proves nothing. I find a new right to attack by the right of the strong, to reconstruct all existing institutions, and to become the sovereign lord of all who left us the rights to their powers by laying them down to us in their liberalism. 6. The power of our resources must remain invisible until the very moment when it has gained such strength that no cunning or force can undermine it. He went on to outline 25 points. Number 8 dealt with the use of alcoholic liquors, drugs, moral corruption, and all vice to systematically corrupt the youth of all the nations. 9. They had the right to seize property by any means and without hesitation, if by doing so they secured submission and sovereignty. 10. We were the first to put the slogans liberty, equality and fraternity into the mouths of the masses, which set up a new aristocracy. The qualification of this aristocracy is wealth, which is dependent on us. 11. 
wars should be directed so that the nations engaged on both sides should be further in our debt. 12. Candidates for public office should be servile and obedient to our commands, so that they may readily be used. 13. Propaganda. Their combined wealth would control all outlets of public information. 14. Panics and financial depressions would ultimately result in world government. A new order of one world government. Close quote. The Rothschild family has played a crucial role in international finance for two centuries, as Frederick Morton in The Rothschilds writes, quote, For the last 150 years, the history of the House of Rothschild has been, to an amazing extent, the backstage history of Western Europe, close quote. Because of their success in making loans, not to individuals but to nations, they reaped huge profits, although as Morton writes, page 36, quote, Someone once said that the wealth of Rothschild consists of the bankruptcy of nations. Close quote. E. C. Knuth writes in The Empire of the City, quote, The fact that the House of Rothschild made its money in the great crashes of history and the great wars of history, the very periods when others lost their money, is beyond question. Close quote. The great Soviet encyclopedia, encyclopedia states, quote, The clearest example of a personal link-up, brackets, international directorates, close brackets, on a Western European scale is the Rothschild family. The London and Paris branches of the Rothschilds are bound not just by family ties, but also by personal link-ups in jointly controlled companies. The encyclopedia further described these companies as international monopolies. The sire of the family, Mayor Amschel Rothschild, established a small business as a coin dealer in Frankfurt in 1743. Although previously known as Bauer, he advertised his profession by putting up a sign depicting an eagle on a red shield, an adaptation of the coat of arms of the city of Frankfurt to which he added five golden arrows extending from the talons, signifying his five sons. Because of this sign, he took the name Rothschild, or Red Shield. When the Elector of Hesse earned a fortune by renting Hessian mercenaries to the British to put down the rebellion in the American colonies, Rothschild was entrusted with this money to invest. He made an excellent profit for both himself and the elector, and attracted other accounts. In 1785, he moved to a larger house, 148 Judengasse, a five-story house known as the Green Shield, which he shared with the Schiff family. The five sons established branches in the principal cities of Europe, the most successful being James in Paris, and Nathan Mayer in London. Ignatius Bala, in The Romance of the Rothschilds, tells us how the London Rothschild established his fortune. He went to Waterloo, where the fate of Europe hung in the balance, saw that Napoleon was losing the battle, and rushed back to Brussels. At Ostend, he tried to hire a boat to England but because of a raging storm, no one was willing to go out. Rothschild offered 500 francs, then 700, and finally 1,000 francs for any boat. One sailor said, quote, I will take you for 2,000 francs, then at least my widow will have something if we are drowned. Close quote. Despite the storm, they crossed the channel. The next morning, Rothschild was at his usual post in the London Exchange. Everyone noticed how pale and exhausted he looked. Suddenly, he started selling, dumping large quantities of securities. Panic immediately swept the exchange. Rothschild is selling. He knows we have lost the Battle of Waterloo. Rothschild and all his known agents continued to throw securities onto the market. Bala says, quote, Nothing could arrest the disaster. At the same time, 
he was quietly buying up all the securities by means of secret agents whom no one knew. In a single day, he had gained nearly a million sterling, giving rise to the saying, The Allies won the Battle of Waterloo, but it was really Rothschild who won. Close quote. In The Prophets of War, Richard Lewisham says, quote, Rothschild's war profits from the Napoleonic Wars financed their later stock speculations. Under Metternich, Austria, after long hesitation, finally agreed to accept financial direction from the House of Rothschild. Close quote. After, the, after the success of his Waterloo exploits, Nathan Mayer Rothschild gained control of the Bank of England through his near monopoly of consoles and other shares. Several central banks, or banks which had the power to issue currency, had been started in Europe. The Bank of Sweden in 1656, which began to issue notes in 1661, the earliest being the Bank of Amsterdam, which had started in 1609, and the Bank of Hamburg in 1619. The establishment of the Bank of England had been made possible by the Bank of Amsterdam, which financed Oliver Cromwell's seizure of power in England in 1649, ostensibly because of religious differences. Cromwell died in 1657, and the throne of England was re-established when Charles II was crowned in 1660. He died in 1685. In 1689, the same group of bankers regained power in England by putting King William of Orange on the throne. He soon repaid his backers by ordering the British Treasury to borrow £1,250,000 from those bankers. He also issued them a royal charter for the Bank of England, which permitted them to consolidate the national debt, brackets, which had just been created by this loan, close brackets, and to secure payments of interest and principal by direct taxation of the people. The Charter forbade private goldsmiths to store gold and to issue receipts, which gave the stockholders of the Bank of England a money monopoly. The goldsmiths also were required to store their gold in the Bank of England vaults. Not only had their privilege of issuing circulating medium being taken away by government decree, but their fortunes were now turned over to those who had supplanted them. Footnote. Note. In the United States, after the stockholders of the Federal Reserve System had consolidated their power in 1934, our government also issued orders that private citizens could not store or hold gold. Returning to the text. In his Cantos, 46, 27, Ezra Pound refers to the unique privileges which William Patterson advertised in his prospectus for the Charter of the Bank of England. Quote, Said Peterson, hath benefit of interest on all the monies which it, the bank, creates out of nothing, close quote. The nothing, which is referred to, of course, is the bookkeeping operation of the bank, which creates money by entering a notation that it has lent you $1,000, money which did not exist until the bank made the entry. By 1698, the British Treasury owed £16 million sterling to the Bank of England. By 1815, principally due to the compounding of interest, the debt had risen to £885 million sterling. Some of this increase was due to the wars which had flourished during that period, including the Napoleonic Wars and the wars which England had fought to retain its American colony. William Patterson, 1658 to 1719, himself benefited little from, quote, the monies which the bank creates out of nothing, close quote, as he withdrew, after a policy disagreement, from the Bank of England a year after it was founded. A later William Patterson became one of the framers of the United States Constitution. While the name lingers on, 
like the pernicious central bank itself. Patterson had found himself unable to work with the Bank of England stockholders. Many of them remained anonymous. But an early description of the Bank of England stated it was, quote, a society of about 1,330 persons, including the King and Queen of England, who had £10,000 of stock, the Duke of Leeds, the Duke of Devonshire, the Earl of Pembroke, and the Earl of Bradford, close quote. Because of his successes in his speculations, Baron Nathan Mayer de Rothschild, as he now called himself, reigned as the supreme financial power in London. He arrogantly exclaimed during a party in his mansion, quote, I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control the British money supply. His brother James in Paris had also achieved dominance in, fr in French finance. In Baron Edmund de Rothschild, David Druck writes, quote, James Rothschild's wealth had reached the 600 million mark. Only one man in, French, in France possessed more. That was the king, whose wealth was 800 million. The aggregate wealth of all the banks in France was 150 million less than that of James Rothschild. This naturally gave him untold powers, even to the extent of unseating governments whenever he chose to do so. It is well known, for example, that he overthrew the cabinet of Prime Minister Thiers. Close quote. The expansion of Germany under Bismarck was accompanied by his dependents on Samuel Bleichrode, court bankers of the Prussian em Emperor, who had been known as an agent of the Rothschilds since 1828. The later Chancellor of Germany, Dr. von Bethmann Holweg, was the son of Moritz Bethmann of Frankfurt, who had intermarried with the Rothschilds. Emperor Wilhelm I also relied heavily on Bischofsheim, also relied heavily on Bischofsheim, Goldsmith, and Sir Ernest Castle of Frankfurt, who emigrated to England and became personal banker to the Prince of Wales, later Edward VII. Castle's daughter married Lord Mountbatten, giving the family a direct relationship to the present British crown. Josephson states that Philip Mountbatten was related through the castles, to the Mayor Rothschilds of Frankfurt. Thus, the English Royal House of Windsor was a direct family relationship to the Rothschilds. In 1901, when Queen Victoria's son, Edward, became King Edward VII, he re-established the Rothschild ties. Paul Emden, in Behind the Throne, says, quote, Edward's preparation for his Mitre was quite different from that of his mother, hence he ruled less than she did. Gratefully, he retained around him men who had been with him in the age of the building of the Baghdad Railway. There were added to the advisory staff Leopold and Alfred de Rothschild, various members of the Sassoon family, and above all his private financial adviser, Sir Ernest Castle. Close quote. The enormous fortune which Castle made in a relatively short time gave him immense power, which he never misused. He amalgamated the firm of Vickers Sons with the Naval Construction Company and the Maxon Nordenfelt Guns and Ammunition Company, a fusion from which there arose the worldwide firm of Vickers Sons and Maxon. On an entirely different capacity from Castle were businessmen like the Rothschilds. The firm was run on democratic principles, and the various partners all had to be members of the family. With great hospitality, and in a princely manner, they led the lives of grand seigneurs, 
and it was natural that Edward the Seventh should find them congenial. Thanks to their international family relationships and still more extended business connections, they knew the whole world, were well informed about everybody, and had reliable knowledge of matters which did not appear on the surface. This combination of finance and politics had been a trademark of the Rothschilds from the very beginning. The House of Rothschild always knew more than could be found in the papers, and even more than could be read in the reports which arrived at the Foreign Office. In other countries, also, the relations of the Rothschilds extended behind the throne. Not until numerous diplomatic publications appeared in the years after the war did a wider public learn how strongly Alfred de Rothschild's hand affected the politics of Central Europe during the twenty years before World War I. Close quote. With the control of the money came the control of the news media. Kent Cooper, head of the Associated Press, writes in his autobiography, Barriers Down, quote, International bankers under the House of Rothschild acquired an interest in the three leading European agencies, close quote. Thus the Rothschilds bought control of Reuters International News Agency, based in London, Havas of France, and Wolf in Germany which controlled the dissemination of all news in Europe. In Inside Europe, John Gunther wrote in 1936 that any French prime minister at the end of 1935 was a creature of the financial oligarchy, and that this financial oligarchy was dominated by twelve regents, of whom six were bankers, and were headed by Baron Edmund de Rothschild. The iron grip of the London connection on the media was exposed in a recent book by Ben J. Bagdekan, The Media Monopoly, described as, quote, a startling report on the 50 corporations that control what America sees, hears, and reads, close quote. Bagdekan, who edited the nation's most influential magazine, the Saturday Evening Post, until the monopoly suddenly closed it down, reveals the interlocking directorates among the 50 corporations which control the news, but fails to trace them back to the five London banking houses which control them. He mentions that CBS interlocks with the Washington Post, Allied Chemical, Wells Fargo Bank, and others, but does not tell the reader that Brown Brothers Harriman controls CBS, or that the Eugene Mayer family, brackets Lazard Ferrers, controlled Allied Chemical and the Washington Post, and Kuhn Loeb and Company, the Wells Fargo Bank. He shows the New York Times interlocked with Morgan Guarantee Trust, American Express, First Boston Corporation, and others, but does show the banking interlocks. He does not mention the Federal Reserve System in his entire book, which is conspicuous by its absence. Bagdekin documents that the media monopoly is steadily closing down more newspapers and magazines. Washington, D.C., with one paper, The Post, is unique among world capitals. London has 11 daily newspapers, Paris 14, Rome 18, Tokyo 17, and Moscow 9. He cites a study from the 1982 World Press Encyclopedia, that the United States is at the bottom of the, international, in the industrial nations in the number of daily newspapers sold per 1,000 population. Sweden leads the list with 572. The United States is at the bottom with 287. There is universal distrust of the media by Americans because of their notorious monopoly and bias. The media unanimously urge higher taxes on working people, more government spending, a welfare state with totalitarian powers, closer relations with Russia, and a rabid denunciation of anyone who opposes communism. This is the programme of the London Connection. It flaunts a, mani a maniacal racism, and has as its motto the dictum of its high priests, Susan Sontag, of its high priestess, Susan Sontag, that, quote, the white race is the cancer of history, close quote. 
opponents in one of two ways, either frontal assault of liable, with the av- which the average person cannot afford to litigate, or an iron curtain of silence, the standard treatment for any work which exposes its clandestine activities. Although the Rothschild plan does not match any single political or economic movement since it was enunciated in 1773, Vital parts of it can be discerned in all political evolution since that date. LaRouche points out that the Round Tables sponsored Fabian Socialism in England, while backing the Nazi regime through the Round Table table member in Germany, Dr. Halmar Schacht, and that they used the Nazi government throughout World War II through Round Table member Admiral Kness. Canaris, while Alan Dulles ran a collaborating intelligence operation in Switzerland for the Allies.